amazing city. Um, I guess I just really want to state that I'm nobody extraordinary. I'm nobody that's just special in every other way. I'm just a regular citizen. I'm just a human. I'm just a single mom. I'm just trying to make the world a better place one step at a time. I'm just trying to be the change that I'm so desperately looking for, but have yet to find. I'm trying to be that leader that not just leads by telling people, but shows people, leads by example. And there are so many issues with Irvine, but the ones that I feel like we aren't really looking at are the biggest issues that we have. The ones that are that are at the heart of our citizens, the ones that are really people are reaching out to us, the ones that are, hey, what are we doing about our social injustice? What are we doing to be a self-sustaining city? What are we doing to lead the to charge and green energy? What are we doing for all these? What are we actually doing as a city? You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I want to be that person that brings forth that change, that steps up that game, that brings Irvine from here to up here. I'm going to be that change. No matter what position I hold or where I'm at in life, I promise Irvine that I'm going to be there for you. No matter what or where or who, it's it's the fact that there's things that need to change within our city and I need to be that change. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, Diana Jang, you are third to deliver your opening statement. Thank you. It's my honor to be here to speak with you. I've been an urban residence for more than 26 years. My two kids attend a public school here. I like juggling tennis and the photograph. Professionally, I earned a master's degree in electrical engineering, has been building and driving highly successful software development team. Technology has many applications to successful running a city with a boss, with us don't just happen. They take a significant input, collaboration, planning, and execution to achieve desired outputs. As a community volunteer, I've been a saga mom, and I have a proud serve as urban children youth and family advisory committee. I also serve a member of UCI Social Science Leadership Society and the UCI Parents Executive Board funding member. I'm part of you addressing veterans issue disability service and entrepreneurships within our community to make UCI a better university for students to experience their college life. As your city council member, I fight to keep our community healthy and safe, keep up with and embrace rapid involving technology, enhance transparency at all level of a city government. I will work to team with innovation and research centers in our university like UCI and the technology companies to advocate for city come ranch in Irvine. It will create more jobs for our residents, including UCI students. Bring in more revenue to the city and provide more community programs to our residents, a positive cycle. I'm here to be your voice in Urban City Council. Please feel free to email me at Diana for Urban at Gmail. Cell phone number is 949-228-9396 to we can communicate directly how to make Urban a better city for everyone, Thank including you, UCI Diana. students. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, Lauren Johnson Norris, you are fourth to deliver your opening statement tonight. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren Johnson Norris. I'm a wife, a mother of twin seven-year-old girls. I'm a 15-year Irvine resident living in University Park. I'm also an attorney, a small business owner, and a city commissioner. My greatest passion is service to our community. I'd be honored to serve as your next city council member. This will not be my first position in community leadership, I've spent the last 17 years of my career as an attorney, fighting for children and families, as well as a community volunteer. My core values are fairness for all people and making sure every young person has access to education and a voice in the community. So I'm running to strengthen what's great about our city, our great parks, our education, and protect our open space. I also will work that we together can be more inclusive, offering community services to our residents, finishing the great park, and I will always be the voice for residents, putting them before any special interests. I'm running a clean money campaign. I'm not backed by big developers, insurance company or investors. We're running a grassroots campaign, not powered by PACs or independent expenditures. 
Most of the volunteers on my team and paid staff are, are, are from college or grad students because my views are progressive and inclusive. And I'll be ready on day one with a COVID plan, a climate action plan, a green public transportation plan, and move forward my progressive agenda to benefit all of our residents, including our UCI students. Because of my leadership, I've earned the endorsements of Congresswoman Katie Porter, Assemblywoman Kati Petri Norris, our Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, many, many others, including the Sunshine Movement at UCI. I look forward to serving our student population and I humbly ask for your vote. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Lauren. And uh, Anshul Garg, you are fifth to deliver your opening statement tonight. Oh, I believe you're muted. Yes, I was. I'm sorry I started speaking, but again, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I welcome all the other candidates as well as the people uh, watching this debate. I really appreciate uh, my position here. Uh, a little bit about me. I am Anshul Garg, live, have lived in Irvine for about 18 years since 2002 with my two daughters. Now they have grown up and my wife uh, and, and I have actually lived in multiple parts of Irvine. So I know uh, how the Irvine has developed. And uh, finally, you know, I stayed, uh, I'm staying at Great Parks now. So I have, I have taken the leap and I have understood how things have improved in the last 20 years with the current people who were in the, in the office and uh, doing their work. The other thing I would say is about what I am going to do when I get to the office, regardless if I make to the office or not, but my main three objectives will remain always the same until I reach them for the city of Irvine. One is I will be having expansion of the police department because Irvine is attracting a lot of people. And we have to make sure that the safest city status remains in our hands. The second one is the small businesses which which have definitely you know got ahead because of this pandemic and the third one is for a renewable energy which i will be uh, promoting for everybody to use along with uh, the ways of recycling because plastic is is still a very big part of your wine which we have to find a way to you know, degenerate it in a proper way. And I am studying a plan from the UCI that they have their own recycling system. And I would like to talk to the right people at UCI and, you know, get that implemented if possible and however we can upgrade that. All right. Other uh, than that. Thank you, Anshul. Um, okay. Uh, let's go ahead and transition to our first topic of tonight, um, COVID-19. So, According to the OC Healthcare Agency, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought over 57,000 cases of coronavirus to Orange County, with Irvine alone having 1,762 positive cases. On April 1st of this year, the City Council approved an executive order requiring Irvine students and visitors to wear a cloth face mask, uh, face covering or face shield when in public places, visiting a retail, commercial, or place of business, at work, and when the resident or visitor is not able to maintain at least six feet of physical distance from another person who is not family, a household member, or lives in the same living unit. If elected to city council, you'd have the power to propose amendments to the order or propose its termination altogether. As a city council member, what changes would you propose to strengthen or weaken the mass mandate We'll start with Abigail Pohl. You have two minutes. To begin with, we need to work with the brilliant scientists and doctors that work for UCI. It's crazy to me that the city has access to one of the greatest research facilities uh, in the state and hasn't taken advantage of it. Uh, second, I work in a warehouse uh, and I have hundreds of people coming in contact with me every single day. Uh, and I make sure to wear my mask, I wear my face protection, I wear my PPE, um, because we all need to be keeping people safe. I have people I need to protect at home, much like you guys do. I, my friend's immunocompromised, who I live with, one of my four roommates, my grandma's immunocompromised, 
I can't risk getting COVID. And that's a problem when people don't wear their masks, which is incredibly common as soon as they get in the warehouse. So I think that not only should this mask mandate be implemented, but it should be enforced harder with whether that be fines or whether that be whatever it is, because it is unfair to those who are trying to keep their loved ones safe to have to worry about other people messing that up for them. It is wrong. Uh, oh God, I can't see the timer, I'm sorry. You have uh, 45 okay. seconds left. Awesome. Not only that, but we need to be increasing our cleanliness standards. We need to make sure that there is more public wash stations as well as hand sanitizer stations as in many public places that everyone can access. Um, that way, everyone has the ability to make sure they're maintaining um, a COVID-free environment. Um, not only that, but I want to make sure going forward that the city is providing these resources to make sure everyone stays safe. Um, we shouldn't have to wait for the state to catch up to our city. We should be at the forefront. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, Christina, you have two minutes. Okay, so I feel that uh, COVID-19 is very real, very scary. So that's, you know, I think we need to be doing everything that we can to really push that um, safety line, you know. I think that even as like fewer cases as we have, we could have fewer than that. I think that there's just a lot of fake information out there, fake news that people are believing or real news that people don't want to believe. And so I think one way that we can really get to people is maybe a more uniform way of information, relaying information. I get the city of Irvine does an amazing job at posting everything online and like, or at least a lot of it online, but it's not always so commonly found amongst um everyday people who aren't as involved in politics as you know me or the people who I associate with. I believe that people are still stuck in thinking that oh we go back to normal and like we go back and I'll say it a hundred times it's no more going back it's about moving forward as you know I actually had a COVID scare a few um like a week ago then I went to the doctor for ear pain and he looked at me and was like you have COVID and I was like oh my god I like almost died you guys like I was so scared and it was like so traumatizing in that moment because I'm like I can't go home. I have a baby at home. I have I have immunocompromised. My dad has rheumatoid arthritis. So it's very scary. And then it's like that moment when, I, when that doctor said, well, you might have COVID. You got to get tested. I thought, well, what am I going to do? What are my resources? What are my options at this point now that I've contacted COVID? And how can I keep my family now safe? And those are the things that were running through my head. Like, yeah, I wore a mask. I, I hand sanitized. I washed my hands. I luckily it was a negative test. You guys, thank God. I was so scared. But, and it, that really made me think that, wow, we're really not prepared for what the worst could be and what the worst is to come. And I think that we need to do a better job of preparing our citizens and preparing ourselves for really what could be happening and what's to come. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Christina. And uh, Diana, you're next. Oh. Um, COVID-19 is a very serious uh, problem for all of us. Um, I work in the aerospace industry. I'm one of the essential service workers. I remember back in March, and uh, when we have this lockdown, I have the special parts. I have a special parts offered by uh, the HR, by the company I'm working for. I can still go to the work because I'm one of the essential workers provide uh, the aerospace service. I believe we should wear the mask, especially for seniors. I did some donation for senior peoples back in March to ask them to wear the mask. We should protect our teachers. School just a start, reopened in September. So me and our friend and we, donate about 8,000 masks to IUSD teachers to protect our teachers and our students. Flu season is around the corner. In, during the flu season, when people get fruit and uh, they are in more easier to get attacked by virus, I believe we should make sure more people get a flu shot during this special time. For people, 
in September, uh, in November, December, January time, it's a high flu season, it's a raining season. We should ask all our, our citizens, including UCI students, to make sure the sanitize when they open the door, when they kind of uh, um, go to the gas station, protect their hands. The metal handle have a lot of uh, um, more virus, I mean. So all of this kind of stuff should be in place to protect our residents. Thank you. All right, thank you, Diana. And uh, Lauren, you have uh, two minutes. The single most important thing that anyone who's working in government must do right now is protect the health of our residents and our workforce with an increase in the use of masks and other PPE. Now, as a mom, I know the safety of our families is a priority, but as a small business owner providing essential services to the community, I know our workforce can't thrive if businesses don't thrive. Now, I'm the only candidate here tonight who's currently working with the city to these ends as a city commissioner over all of our parks, our community centers, over our sports and recreation, and putting in place practical and effective safety measures right now. As a council member, I will agendize a COVID plan working closely with UCI and public health officials. First, we'll designate a public health officer who will coordinate with public nurses, with public health officials, with IUSD, and with businesses to make sure that we have adequate PPE. Second, we'll provide assistance to homeowners, to renters, and to businesses who are suffering during this time. And third, we'll coordinate with all of our stakeholders at the county, state, and federal level to make sure we bring back enough money for PPE from the CARES Act and HEROES Act. So I think the question about our mask ordinance is really important. And what I'm pleased to say is that having looked at the enforcement side of this from the city's perspective, we have had an overwhelmingly positive response with voluntary compliance in this city. Our residents do care about the health and safety of their families, as well as the health of, and safety of others. And because of that compliance with both city ordinance and state law, we've been able to keep our Irvine residents safe and keep those levels down. So I think it's important to continue to follow on that path and support it with robust testing, contact tracing, data collection, and more PPE. All right, thank you, Lauren. And Anshul, you have uh, two minutes. Sure, thank you very much for the question. And it is actually uh, a deeper uh, question for, for not only Irvine, but the whole world right now. What we can do for Irvine being, you know, we are, we are the people who can afford things. Uh, we can definitely have and follow the CDC guidelines or any special guidelines which, which come after this uh, uh, COVID issue. And I would say, you know, masks uh, is something which, which is working for everybody right now. It is not that it is not working in some cases. If you are having the masks, it is working. And the first effort should be to save everyone or making safe environments so that we have our masks, quantity and quality so that we can save all the elderly as well as children, students, as uh, Diana said. And we have to make sure that we get proper funding for that if people are not able to afford. Right now, I have been into a company just visiting. It is a medical company right here in Irvine. And they have a abundance of supply of PPE and uh, masks. So it is not that, you know, we are not getting in the, in some, some, some people were saying that we are not even getting it. But I don't think that is the right thing. We have things and resources available. The first and foremost would be to implement the process where we have to save everybody through the masking. And this is a question which I have received in my personal email also. And they were wanting to tell me that, hey, if you come to the council, would you remove the mask? And I have to say no, you know, not just to get their word, but I have to say no. So basically we have to, we have to keep going with this until we have a vaccine created. All right. Well, thank you for your answers to that question, um, Michelle. All right. 
we will now be moving on to open discussion for the topic of COVID-19. Candidates, you may physically raise your hand to be called on, and each candidate will have one minute to speak. To get the conversation going, as a city council member, what steps would you take to ensure a safe reopening of Irvine? Um, we will go in the same order if the candidate was like, would like to speak. Um, Abigail Pohl, you are first. So um, to begin with, we should increase access to masks and make masks more accessible. The city has bags for dog poop, but not for masks. And I think we can change that. Um, also, I don't understand why we don't have dispensers that provide hand sanitizer um, in high traffic areas. Um, the bottom line is if we don't maintain the health of our community, we won't have much of a community. A big part of the community is the students. UCI has done a phenomenal job with contacting, tracing, daily check-ins and weekly testing. I don't think the current city administration is serving all citizens of Irvine by not working with the university to implement the same standards across the city. Um, I have 25 seconds left, awesome. Um, not only that, but we need to make sure as we're going and about opening businesses, we're doing so in a safe way. I'm not gonna pretend I have all the answers. I didn't get a degree in medicine or public health, but I would love to reach out with the university and see their expertise and information that they have to say with a partnership with the city council. Thank you. Christina Dillard, if you would like a minute to speak. Yeah, okay, so I think that that's really awesome, Abigail. I think that's a great idea, and I think that utilizing UCI, because honestly, when I think of UCI, I think of medicine. I think of one of the top dogs in medicine. I think that being, you know, I like Abigail said, like, I am no expert. I don't pretend to know. I'm not, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a health official. I'm a person. I'm a human. I'm a citizen here in this community, and that, you know, as as somebody who understands that, I know that I need to reach out to those other people that can help better develop these things for the city. And it's like, it's shocking that we're already not doing some of these things and that some of these things that I, I see businesses taking initiative on and doing that our own city can't do. And I think that it's not just at fault of our officials. I think that we can definitely be more of a driving force for our officials and getting what we really need across to them. I think that um, it also just has to do with, you know, that open line of communication and contract tracing and really figuring out how to nip it in the butt. Now, no more like, oh, maybe if answer buts, it's more like, let's get down to business. Thank you, Christina. Diana, John, you're next to speak. Um, <clears throat> I think the mask enforcement should be in the place. City of Irvine has executive order for people to wear masks inside of a sh grocery shopping, inside of a uh, um, shopping center. We should continue doing that. I saw people have a question over there talking about the grocery uh, store near the UCI. There's no mask enforcement over there. We should implement the enforcement. If we have a policy here, we should make sure the implementation in place. And uh, again, the full season will start very soon to wear masks it's not just for ourselves, it's for other people too. It's the responsibility for other people not to get uh, impact. So this is, uh, um, I believe, this is good for all of the UCI students, for all of the uh, urban residents. And uh, um, open space, probably it's good when people need to go to um, sports outside, but indoor, we gotta be very, very careful. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Lauren Johnson Norris. Yeah, I think that, you know, I really want to underscore the importance of those serving at our city level, stepping into leadership roles where there's been a vacuum. We know on the federal level that we've had no concrete policy in place to serve all of the folks who live in this country. And down to the county level here in Orange County, we've had a hodgepodge of policies that have failed residents. Now in Irvine, we're so fortunate, we early on put in um, place mask rules for grocery stores and eventually expanded those to match what the state has enforced. But we know in other cities, we have not had that level of compliance that we're having here. I hear a heavy emphasis on enforcement, as I noted earlier, 
you're not having an enforcement problem um, statistically or otherwise. We have our residents in compliance. I think we continue on the good path that we're going, continuing to strengthen our what we have to offer the, the residents in terms of PPE. Thank you, Lauren. And Anshul Garg, you are fit for speaking. Uh, so this uh, COVID-19 situation is really, really scary because now we are hearing about uh, our president has it and the first lady also might be affected. So this is definitely a serious uh, uh, thing. And I have seen, we are opening parks. I, I read somebody's letter that, hey, state is allowing to open parks and people don't even, you know, try to read the whole thing in there and they just run to parks that, hey, they are open. So on the weekend, I was uh, I was just strolling over at the Boss Trail in Great Parks and I saw that parents were very close, but they were wearing masks and any children who were running around, they were not wearing any masks or their parents were not even looking at them that, hey, what they are doing. So what what uh, I would say is that, you know, the first thing should be we we find out the number of masks or or the supply we should provide to the residents. Free or non-free, it, it, it is a different question, but we should have this in abundance. The second one is we have to implement it. Well, so these are the two main points. On to the next. Topic. Thank you for your time, though. Um, so that concludes our topic on COVID-19, and we'll be moving on to our second topic on the Irvine environment. And Thomas will be asking our first question. All right, thank you. Uh, topic number two of tonight is uh, Irvine environment. Um, in 2019, the city of Irvine took the first steps to developing a climate action plan. The plan would build on steps already being taken by the city to be more environmentally friendly. Steps already taken include the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions through the use of electric vehicles for the city's fleet and a decrease in the use of chemicals to treat the city's parks and nature areas. With step, what steps would you like to see written into Irvine's climate action plan? We will start with you, uh, Diana. So I think our city of Irvine has been pioneered to implement the uh, environment friendly, like uh, the lead, the greenhouse. We want to make sure, continue that part, to make sure all of the building in Irvine continue to be environment friendly, to reduce the energy cost. Um, it's good, it's good to the, uh, for the people walking inside of a building is better for their health. And also I fully support commit to support to not using chemical for our the grass. This is good for kids who has allergy. And also I think it's good to continue to keep our open space. It, Irvine has a, a lot of open space which is uh, important for the quality of life. So we need to continue to, to support the open space part. Another thing is about water. As we know, the water usage, it's uh, uh, how to keep our public grass to be water usage efficiency. City of Urban, we are using the recycling water to water the grass. And we should continue doing that for new areas. We we'll also need to do that. This is uh, good for the during the if we have the water shortage. That will help us to not wasting water. So all of this implementation should be in place and continue doing that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Diana. Uh, Lauren, you have two minutes. Climate change is the greatest existential threat of our generation. I've been endorsed by the Orange County League of Conservation Voters and the Sunshine Movement at UCI because of my commitment to fighting climate change and my support of a standalone climate action plan. Every city is already mandated by state law to have a climate action plan. 
we have one, but we need a standalone document that, be can, that can be updated more than once every 10 years. And the question remains, what will ours require? Community choice energy is one piece, but community choice energy alone is not enough. I've created a standalone climate action plan with UCI professors with a goal for the next 10 and 20 years to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It will inventory emissions, set a reduction goal, and implement strategies to achieve the needed reductions. There are many benefits to doing so. It goes across sectors that we have those benefits. One thing that we can do right now is implement clean energy through transportation also to reduce traffic. We can use our education system to create a new workforce of good paying jobs that prioritize local hiring, veteran hiring, and those would be green jobs. And with regard to building and development, we can help reduce home energy costs and keep our dollars here in Irvine. We also must reduce water consumption and incentivize native landscaping. I think that we should move forward with our climate goals with an eye toward environmental justice. And we need leaders who know who they are who know that they will stand up to fight against climate change right here at home and will not back down under pressure due to special interests. We just need people who will get this done. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lauren. And uh, Anshul, you have uh, two minutes. Oh, I think you're still muted. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much for the question. And uh, I heard the uh, uh, responses from uh, other candidates and uh, I, I love the ideas. And as I was saying, you know, I'm all about uh, renewable energy and, uh, you know, use of plastic and recycle and all that. So I also want to have, uh, you know, uh, remove the carbon footing on our soil in Irvine, at least whatever we can do. Uh, people are already encouraged to buy, uh, you know, or have maintain their uh, you know, electric vehicles, which which we have to move forward, and uh, you know, our governor also signed some order about it, which which not not feasible for everyone, I guess. Uh, but I think uh, this is one thing which we have to do. The second thing is about the uh, open areas that Diana was talking. So, I I have heard that current mayor has already taken some initiative on that, and she has been working with the with the maintenance of the greenery in uh, the city areas treating with a different type of chemical or organic chemical or something which is not very harmful for the others so what we have to do is we have to continue doing that because you know you you have to build a house you can build a house like you know in a very short period of time but maintaining it is something which uh, which take most effort so for the for the benefit of Irvine resident and everybody we should be continuously doing this and I, I really uh, really think now that the UCI we have all the people UCI has all the people who can guide all the staff or all the office members sitting in the city council so we should be going for everything to them because they are the tech people you know they are they are studying they, their work is to study all the time why because they are uh, studying and they are you know giving education to different uh, students and then students become teachers so what i'm saying is that uci oh, is a very oh, good resource thank I'm you gonna, the, the, okay. um i was going to give you another 30 seconds to finish your thought if you like yeah, absolutely. So it's, I think that we have a whole, whole, uh, you know, uh, box of treasure as uh, UCI people and we should, we should leverage them to help us because they are in the same city, although, although UCI is considered to be a, you know, different island, but I would do that if I come to the office or not, it does not matter. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Abigail, uh, you have two, two minutes to answer the question. So nothing exists in a vacuum. So climate action will need a comprehensive approach. And in order to explain my climate plans, I have to explain my vision for future Irvine. I want to rezone the city to increase uh, percentages of multifamily and low income housing more to like 50 or 60 percent. Then I want to use tax incentives to convince older building owners to install solar panels on their structures so that Irvine can contribute to the energy grid and become energy independent. After this, 
I want to improve our traffic problem by creating a robust clean energy fleet of buses, which will be paid for by the increased economic activity of new residents in this new housing. In addition, I want to create an Irvine credit union that eliminates the need for bank fees. Our city spends millions in those unnecessarily and use the post office branches as well. In addition, the additional revenue should help us create a free municipal Wi-Fi for Irvine residents. Um, I don't see climate action as an existential threat. It is a real threat that our own scientists are telling us that we're running out of time. I'm one of the people that lives here, like all of you once again, and I want to live here for a long, long time. And I can't do that if our air continues to become polluted and we keep creating bigger and bigger carbon footprints without any thought going forward. Thank you for my time. All right, thank you, Abigail. And I'm gonna go ahead and repeat the question for Christina. Uh, what steps would you like to see written into the Irvine's Climate Action Plan? You have uh, two minutes to answer. Okay, so to be honest, I don't know why solar isn't a bigger thing down here in Irvine. Like we are in Southern California, like we have the golden sunny sun. I think we need to definitely push forward with more solar and alternative uh, uses. I love everything that Abigail has said. We only have one planet. We really need to take care of it. I don't know if any of you have seen the Lorax, but that's where we're quickly headed. I don't know if it's really gonna take somebody selling air out of a can before people really wanna start to realize that they can't breathe money, that they can't eat money that they can't just you can't survive purely off of money you have to have resources to spend your money on therefore you can live so unless you want to be buying air from a can lining the pockets of some short stubby guy then we really need to really make a change and i think that starts right in house with our elected officials i think that starts with them putting their selves out there like yo we're out here recycling like my family we recycle everything we be sure to make sure that or we're sure to make sure that we play at least a small part in making the world a better place, if not for ourselves, but for the next generation. What kind of world are we leaving for our kids? What kind of place are we leaving for our kids? Now, I view Irvine as a city that is one that is self-sustaining in so many aspects, like Miss Abigail Pohl said, from banking systems, and like Miss Lauren Johnson said, from our own transportation systems. Irvine has the potential to be completely independent in the face of all this adversity. It's just a matter of our elected officials getting us there. It's a matter of us pushing our elected officials to get us there. It's a matter of the people showing them what democracy is really all about and getting the changes that we need to see present. We need to recycle. Why is that not mandatory? Why are we still even allowing 10 cent paper plastic bags? There, it's not like people aren't paying for these bags and then throwing them away. Why are we not doing more with our own water conservation and doing more with trying to make sure our water system is um, doing our own things with water and purifying our own water system. These are the things I would like to see Irvine do. All right, thank you, Christina. And Michelle will go ahead and lead the open discussion. Yes, so we are now in open discussion on the topic of the Irvine environment. So if the can any of the candidates would like to start off the discussion, you can raise your hand on camera to be called on. All right, Anshul raised his hand if he would like to start. Sorry, Anshul. I, I think, think the best. Answer. I think the best point we can uh, we can agree on that we need to actually take actions and not just uh, you know sit back in the offices as uh, you know the other candidates said. We we just have to push forward ourselves to work towards the better uh, approach uh, and uh, you know for the better climate of Irvine. Uh, and as I said, you know we we have UCI right here and we can use those those intellectual uh, mass to guide us you know th there is no harm in asking if we don't know and uh, as as uh, you know all these buses and all these are you know leaving their carbon uh, footprint we, we we can we can definitely make some moves to you know remove those from our roads and uh, you know provide a better environment to the Irvine residents. And it should it should go as a as a bigger approach to, you know, start growing from Irvine to neighboring cities, to state, to, you know, the country, to world. Uh, I'm, I'm that kind of person, you know, we should do it for everyone. 
Thank you, Anshul. Um, candidates, do any of you would like to carry on the conversation? Um, if not, I can go ahead and, um, okay. Diana, um, if you'd like to start or respond. Um, the environment protection is very important for us and for our kids and for our grandkids. Um, like the beach cleaning, I go to do beach cleaning myself and I took my family to do beach cleaning also. We should work with uh, UCI, the research center to find a better way how to recycle, how to take care of the plastic. And uh, that's a technology to really kind of uh, improve our environment. So there are a lot of things we can do it together to protect our environment. Thank you. For the three other candidates, um, you are welcome to raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Abigail, you may go ahead first and then I'll call on Christina after. Yes, um, so Christina mentioned something interesting that I don't feel was mentioned enough. Why aren't we better about our own water conservation? We have many farms in Irvine, like Tanaka Farms that provides low income students uh, food fresh food, they need that water. Um, in addition, we can do this. In a previous debate, I mentioned how much unused space on top of buildings isn't used and could be used for solar panels. UCI has hydrogen vehicle refueling stations. We could advertise that. There are so many wonderful things we could do and we're not doing any of it. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. And then Christina, you had your hand up. Yeah, like I said, I don't understand why um, we don't offer more recycling programs, um, more like kid friendly interactive things like I know that Santa Ana has a discovery science cube. But I think that protecting our planet starts with our kids because a lot of the kids are out here doing like littering and do, um, not recycling. And I think it also starts with them. Just as we look to protect them, we need to educate them and push them to create a better world for themselves and their future children. I mean, I would love to see my grandson at some point in time. So I would love to leave a world to them that I can, you know, be proud of. And so it's it comes down to why aren't we allowing our, our why aren't we as, you know, leaders and public officials doing more with our uh, the, the resources we have. We tell everybody that asks for help or anything, well, what about the resources you have? What about the resources you have? Well, us as a city, what about the resources we have as a city? Why are we not utilizing them to their full potential? Thank you, Christina and Lauren. Uh, you are welcome to speak. I think it's important to understand that we as individuals can do things like go to the beach and clean up or do our own compost garden, which um, compost program, which in fact we are now going to be implementing coming soon at the city level. But I think that individuals alone can't solve this problem. We know from the data that emissions is the greatest contributor to climate change. And that's where a transportation plan that's green must be implemented. You know, this is not something that we have time to wait. We don't. Our kids are already impacted. And so when I say this is an existential threat, what I mean is that it is a threat to our existence. It is a threat to our very existence as humans. And we must, as government actors, should we be elected, work on this problem, solve this problem for our city, and lead the region so that other cities may use our plan as a template to move forward. Thank you. All right, thank you candidates. And that wraps up our discussion on um, Irvine environment. So we will be moving on to our third topic on housing and development. And I will be asking the first question. So rising rents and a lot of affordable housing have begun to price families out of the city of Irvine. In the last 10 years, Irvine has only built 4,568 affordable housing units. What steps will you take to increase the number of affordable housing units? Anshul, you are up first. Oh, this time I'm not mute. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, I I think the affording housing, affordable housing is definitely 
an issue for the people who actually uh, want to live in uh, you know big uh, famous cities want to want to use their amenities and uh, you know all the parks and uh, pools and you know what not and while while they are not able to afford they have to live in around areas so i want to say that you know they should not have the right to come in because they don't earn so much but i would say that we just have to be very careful uh, when we talk about irwin's legacy of having the open spaces and all all, all you know things parks and uh, you know schools and uh, you know spacious uh, roads we we just have to be very careful how we are going to provide that to people and uh, i have i have seen i have seen that people are driving from uh, i don't know from from the other part of riverside and you know it from pasadena or or uh, you know corona or la uh, to come to irwin to work while you know these should these people should not be should not be spending their uh, you know one fourth of the life in their car driving on those freeways which are always jammed so we have to figure out a way and when we talk about the traffic situation this is actually also you know concerning i was reading somewhere that uh, you know the traffic the cars on the roads are more in the daytime in our wine than in the evening or in the early morning which is because people are coming in people are coming in to work so i definitely say that we should we should do something good to drive uh, the housing for the people coming in cannot afford and and this this would also solve our traffic problems thank you so thank much you. Anshu. abigail you are up next awesome so like i said before first we need to start by rezoning we need to make sure we're also providing tax base incentives for developers to build low income housing we also need to look at our ordinances regarding boarding homes, um, as well as institute policy that prevents exploitative companies like Airbnb from coming in and causing a housing shortage that drives home rental prices so high. No one can afford to live here. I, I know the need. <laughs> I live in a two bedroom apartment with four people. And as a young person, that's, that's really lucky. <laughs> I know plenty of other places where everyone's stacked three to a room and that's just what you have to do because you want that better life that this city offers. I hope that going forward with this rezoning would make it a lot easier for not only students who are currently living here in Irvine, but after they graduate, we can then keep the students living here. I'm committing to make an accessible Irvine because what what is the point of having a city where no one can live in it um thank you for your time thank you abigail up next we have christina okay so i uh, that like a lot of like housing development that's a lot that's a big so one thing i really believe in is um businesses offering them those tax incentives that they want so desperately bad to be here in Irvine to hire locally, hire diversity. That'll cut down on so much tra traffic and congestion and people will be more, more likely to rely on public transportation because they wouldn't need to go as far for work or for school or anything like that. I do agree with Abigail and the whole rezoning because a lot of people are upset that these college kids are dorming together in like places local or places close towards um, campus and everything. But why are we mad at that? Are we not happy that we have UCR? Are we not lucky that to have such wonderful minds and now we're making it harder for them to live here and go to these schools? Is Now I ask you, is safety only for the elite? Is safety only for the upper class? Is safety only for the rich? So do you are, you, are we not confident in Irvine Police Department's ability to keep us safe, even allowing homeless and more people into our city? Are we not confident in our police department? Because then that raises another question about our police department, then wouldn't it? And then wouldn't that raise the question about, well, is safety only for the elite and only for the rich? Now, I don't even see homeless housing or homeless resources here in Irvine. So that would be a place to start. Why don't we have homeless resources, homeless housing? Why don't we have more resources for our veterans, for at-risk youth, for runaway children? Why don't we have more of these programs and resources for them? So I'm just, 
I'm, I'm really desperately asking, like, is it really a crime? Is it really that bad to have these resources for lower income? Why don't we work on programs to reintegrate them back into society here in Irvine, leading a better life, leading that better charge, you know, making it make being more productive and being a part of a functioning society. I truly see Irvine being a city so great like that. I truly see that they can definitely surpass that level that we're at now of comfortability with the homeless crisis or at-risk crisis to a level of up here, guys. Thank you, Christina. Diana, you are forced to speak. Um, Irvine population is a 6% of Orange County, and we provide 32% of affordable housing. And uh, Irvine already has the highest number of, of affordable units in Orange County. And we should do more for two good reasons. Without some entry level housing, our own children won't be able to live in the city in which they were raised. Without the next tier of a workforce housing, our teachers, nurses, firefighters, and the police cannot live in the community they protect. It will be a shame if we cannot fix that problem. The challenge is how to provide a balanced solution. I do not support turning single family neighborhoods into an ocean of the triplex. I do think we can do more to streamline the permitting process for projects that conform to our plan. I think state should share part of their sales tax as an incentive for cities that meet their housing goals. We should build more multifamily housing around near the university and the job centers. And uh, when we build enough supply to fill the demand and the housing price will be reduced. We need to provide more products at a wide range of the price so that home ownership can be affordable for more people. That's the ultimate solution so that more young people can afford and a sustainable solution for all of us. And uh, with a pandemic, a lot of uh, vacant office space, we should look at how to turn those vacant office space to be mixed use as apartment. Even after the pandemic, more people will work from home. Let's change the pattern of the people working. So we need to be creative to provide a solution for all of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And Lauren, you are a fifth to speak. We are facing a housing crisis here in Irvine, but also in the region and statewide. So it is incumbent on elected officials on the municipal level to put policies in a place to incentivize affordable housing and to make sure that there is enough housing for the demand. I have a long history of working with homeless families, first as a college volunteer, then as a lawyer serving some of the most vulnerable members of our community here in Orange County. I currently continue to serve that population as a, a part of my practice. So I know that rising housing costs coupled with the fact that wages have not increased have really put the crunch on many families, students and working people. I've had the opportunity over the last three years as a city commissioner to help allocate about $6 million in community development block grants from the federal government to prevent housing, um, to prevent homelessness right here in Irvine, to rapidly rehouse homeless families, young people, and seniors. And I think that we must build upon the successes that we have in Irvine through inclusionary zoning, as well as our Irvine Community Land Trust which right now is working on its next project, though it certainly has not been able to meet the need in the community, which is so large. I would like to see us expand the Irvine Community Land Trust, working with electeds at the state federal level, and also incentivize and streamline the projects that will house working families, seniors, veterans, our first responders, and teachers. You know, no one is suggesting we turn University Park or single family neighborhoods into high density areas. But it is critical that we meet the needs of the residents who live right here in Irvine. No one should live in their car. 
No one should live in our parks. We should house. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you candidates for answering that question. And Thomas will be um, covering the next part. All right, uh, we are now in the open discussion for this topic. So candidates, please raise your hands to be called on to further discuss this issue. All right, uh, Lauren, you have uh, one minute. I have, have been reached out by many students at UCI and IVC who've said that they have tremendous difficulty finding and keeping housing in this region. The city council has ignored the needs of UCI residents, sometimes not coming down to even have a conversation with them. I've invited them to our community services commission, not only to talk about housing, but food insecurity at UCI. We must do a better job at the city level, working with the, U the university regents, listening, also working with developers to make sure that our students are housed. You know, you can't do well in school and have a bright future if you're worried about where you're gonna sleep. And some of the conditions that young people are experiencing at the college level, checking up with other students and housing that's not suitable just shouldn't happen in our city. So my commitment is to our students that I will do better and I will work and listen to you and work on your behalf. All right, thank you, Lauren. And if anyone else would like to uh, go ahead and open discuss this issue, please raise your hand. All right, Anshul, you have uh, one minute. I will unmute first. Thank you so much for, for giving me the, another minute to talk about this. And uh, I would definitely agree, uh, agree to the point that, you know, students should not be worried about where they are going to sleep tonight. Which, which definitely makes sense. But when, when these, in, these type, in these times of pandemic, when the colleges are uh, you know, totally closed and there are no classes, I think they can go back to their places and you know, the city people will continuously work on that if, if they are really, really uh, you know, determined to eradicate this problem. But uh, you know, students living in the same apartments now, and uh, you know, this is some some. I would say the uh, the responsibility should be divisive, a little bit uh, in between the UCI itself, who are the people who are taking the fee from these students, and none of that part I think go to the city. But I would definitely say that you know, when talking to builders and uh, having you know more uh, right. affordable housing would help Thank everyone. You. Would you like an additional 30 seconds to complete your thought? Yeah, but so what I'm saying is, you know, again, you know, we, we have to think through both ways. Uh, UCI, as I know that UCI do not pay anything to the city while, you know, they are charging fees from the students and they are providing the uh, living area to the students. So I think the, the people, uh, the UCI team should think about it and you know, reduce down the living expenses and the housing at least, so that a student can have uh, confidence that yes, they are going to be sleeping in a house tonight. So oh, that's right. it. Thank you for that. And uh, if anyone else, all right, Diana, you're, uh, you have one minute. I believe the open communication is essential to build up trust. If student has uh, some concern of uh, not able to live in a room, have to live in the car, and uh, please come to talk. And um, I'm I have an open door policy. My phone number and email address is provided. And uh, let's talk together how to find a solution. It will be very unfortunate to see our students sleep in the car. And uh, uh, we need to address it. And I believe the best solution, we need to build more kind of apartment around university and the job center, and uh, which is uh, compliant with a general plan of our city. And uh, Irvine is the city of uh, advanced uh, education hub with a UCI, this school, we should take care of the students. Thank you. All right, thank you, Diana. 
And if no one else wants to answer that, I can go ahead and ask a, oh, awesome. Um, I saw Abigail, I believe first. So go ahead. Okay. Well, I guess we'll go with Christina. You have one minute. Okay, so it's really expensive to live in Irvine. If you look at the price for a one bedroom, um, even like just trying to rent a room out, it's somewhere of upward of $800. Why is it like that? What is the gain there? What are we trying to do to our citizens? So I do know that Irvine has implemented a program with um, for affordable housing and SNAPs for them starting that because that didn't go unacknowledged. But now it comes to like abuse of that system. Now it comes to, okay, are they really people that need affordable housing in this building or are people driving around in Bentleys, Teslas, Rolls Royce? Are, what, how are we going to prevent that? How are we going to really reach to the people that need these resources and need these actual um, things while enforcing that and then I have another question about that. So are these are gonna are these gonna be for our permanent residences as well? Are these gonna be for our non our foreign for our foreign born and American US citizens? That's a very valid question that you know I think really needs to All be right. answered. Uh Christina, um would you like 30 seconds to finish your thought? Yeah, I would love that 30 seconds. Okay. I would really appreciate that. Yeah, so I think that that raises the issue of our foreign-borns and like, hey, they're a permanent resident here and do they not pay their taxes? Do they not pay into this? So why do they have zero say-so? Because we said that's how it should be because we said so long ago that, oh, like if you're not a U.S. citizen, that I don't think that's right. I think that's something that can change because they're, they're, they're the backbone and they really need our support. All right, and Abigail, you have one minute to uh, continue this discussion. It is hypocritical to lord UCI as a research institution and ask for their help in certain issues and then not provide for the students. Not only that, but I am very glad that to hear Diana and I are on the same page and we should rezone the city to allow more multifamily homes and more low income houses to be built. Of course, providing tax incentives to have these buildings built will increase the supply, as candidate Jang said. This is not a problem that the university can solve on its own. This has something that the city has to do. This is where the city council needs to have an open dialogue with the students and their concerns to find a solution. I have had multiple times where friends or people who I've met in classes come and crash on our couch because there's nowhere else to go. We have currently a bed in our living room because that's all we can afford. This is a problem for all of us and we all need to work together to fix it. All right, thank you candidates. And that completes our first part of tonight's event. Uh, we will be having a five minute break. And when we return, the moderators will be asking the candidates questions submitted by the public. We will return at 8.17. All right, thank you.
All right, it looks like everyone is back, so welcome back. We are now in the second half of the Dippy, where Thomas and I will be taking questions submitted through our survey and the live Q&A. Each candidate will have one minute to respond. Um, candidates, you will have the option to raise your hand if you would like to respond first. All right, we will go ahead and move on to the first question. Um, Michelle from Airvine, not me by the way, would like to ask the candidates, will you support the State Veterans Cemetery on the RDA site, oh sorry, ARDA site, and begin the site clearing and transfer process to the state? Candidates, you are welcome to raise your hand if you would like to respond. Christina? Yeah, um, I don't understand why it really has not been done. I get that there's been a lot of like conflict and grief and um, a lot of like sneaky weegy stuff that's been going on with it. But I think that we're losing sight on what that's truly meant to be about. And I think that's truly just meant to be about giving a place for those veterans to like finally lay their heads and for families to be able to go to a safe and peaceful place to finally be able to see what they are and or see their loved ones rest and be able to memorialize them. And I think that the city has lost sight of that vision. And I think that being on the council, I will truly bring that vision back. And I know that um, it's, it is, they say that there's, you know, it's in the state's hands, but no, it's, it's, it's within our hands. We are the people, we are democracy here and we will see this to the end and we will get that done because I feel like that's the least we can do as a city. Christina, any other candidates wish to respond? Anshul? Yes, I was on mute. So uh, as, as uh, you know, Christina said, you know, it's, I, I definitely just don't want to get into right now because, you know, this I am, I am not very much aware of the whole situation. I have, uh, you know, the air flows and people hear things like that kind of thing I have heard. So it is it is really important for me to make any decision with the informed uh, knowledge, which is really something which, you know, with I, I, uh, I think there was another candidate supposed to join in tonight's, uh, tonight's uh, you know, talk of ours who has not joined, but uh, without taking the name, I would say that he is, is still, uh, you know, trying to promise the cemetery to uh, the veterans right away as soon as he get into the office. While, while uh, you know, this has started from his tenure and he was well aware of it and, uh, you know, he could have done all these years something, why this thing is lingering on for so long. So I am just, I'm just trying to say that, hey, you know, it's, don't, don't give the false hope. Please do not give the false hope. All right, thank you, Anshul. Um, the three other candidates, if you'd like to speak. Um, Abigail, I see your hand up. The Veterans Memorial Park Cemetery has always been about constructing it on the best site in Irvine, which is the ARDA site. The state approved the ARDA site and has committed 30 million and the Department of Veteran Affairs also approved the ARDA site and an announcement from Sharon Quirk Sevilla said that the federal government would commit another 10 million. There's no excuse. My grandfather is a veteran and California has the second highest population of veterans. And there's no place for California to lay our veterans to rest. This isn't an issue of money that has already been committed. This is an issue of developers that have a stranglehold on our local politics. That's one of the reasons why my campaign is completely people powered and people funded. I hope going forward that we will fix this issue. Thank you. You know, I'm married to a United States Coast Guard veteran. Both of my grandfathers served in World War II, my great uncle in Korea. So this issue is really personal to our family. I want my girls one day to be able to visit their father when he passes away at a veteran cemetery right here in Orange County where we live. There's no reason that a widow should have to go to Riverside 
um, to, to see a family member after they've passed away. So I um, absolutely support beginning construction right away at the ARDA site. You know, the voters overwhelmingly support this site. There are funds and it is time that we provide a final resting place to our veterans and honor our word to them. They have sacrificed so much for us. Thank you. Our veterans who has put their lives on their line for our country deserve a proper resting place in honor of their sacrifice. The veteran cemetery was approved by the city council and the initial funding was approved by our governor. I do not advocate building any new amenity without a funding source identified to build our or maintain it. I do commit to working with the neighboring community to make sure their voice was heard during the design and the construction phases. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. We'll move on to the next question. Jesse from Irvine would like to ask the candidates, what are your thoughts on the Black Lives Matter movement? No, can I go first? All right, um, I'll let Anshul go and then Christina. Okay, so uh, let me check. Yes, I can be heard. So I, I am totally in support of uh, BLM movement. I would use the short term just because of the strain of time. Uh, where people have to have their voices heard, they have lost somebody which was not at all, uh, you know, acceptable way how he lost his life. Uh, the movement started all good, everything is good, but there comes the part of uh, protest, which is which is converting to a riot, which I am totally against with because, you know, if, if there is a riot, you know, it's who are you hurting? You are hurting the person who passed away. You are hurting the feeling of his family, people who are trying to mourn while they are hearing the news about the riots related to the BLM movement. So these things are definitely have to be, you know, uh, handled properly in the way they should be if the law is being broken somewhere. But I am totally in support of the protests because that is a very good way to... Uh, to give everyone the same amount of time. Okay. Awesome. Christina, I see your hand up next. And then I believe Lauren was after that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Black Lives Matter, guys. That That's always been a fact. That will always be a fact. That is that is forever standing. Black lives still matter. And it's not a matter of like they died and we're just prolonging their death or the morning of their death. But no, these people have died so injustiously and there still have been no justice for these deaths. A wall mattered more than Breonna Taylor. So I'm so passionate about Black Lives Matter. So no, you can't say that, oh, you're prolonging the death. No, these people died as martyrs to our cause. Now there are still deaths happening every day. And it's still there's still injustice every day. So yeah, no, black lives matter. Black lives still matter and protests matter. There have been no riots in Irvine. There's been no looting in Irvine. So therefore the whole fear and like inflicting that fear upon people that, oh, the Black Lives Matter movement is associated with fear. But I could have sworn that because last night the Lakers won that there was rioting and looting then. Was that associated with Black Lives Matter? I think not. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, Lauren, you're up next. And then after that, we saw Abigail. I want to say unequivocally that Black Lives Matter, that Latinx lives matter, that Indigenous lives matter. And as a city council member, I will represent all of the diverse voices in this city. I'm the only candidate here that has spent their entire career standing up for the most marginalized folks in our community and people of color every day in court to strive for bat battling a broken criminal justice system and providing equity, racial justice and economic justice. And I will continue to do that on the Irvine City Council. My campaign has formed a diversity action council with the goal of implementing policies, 
should I be elected? And I hope to be able to agendize a diversity commission. This team has helped advise me with our diverse residents. And um, I'm just honored to be able to work with our diverse community. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Abigail, you're welcome to speak. Black Lives Matter is literally the minimum. Black lives need to be valued, they need to be cherished, and they need to be loved. And on that note of thinking, why is there a police force on campus? I've worked with the care office, I've worked with those who are battling mental health issues, and in none of those cases have the police helped. Absolutely none. In fact, they made the situations worse and it made it harder for the social workers and people providing resources to get them those resources. Not only that, but there is no reason to have them there as a force, except if it's to oppress students. They didn't help Tamara, they didn't help Shakira, and going forward, there is no guarantee they will help any other student on Irvine campus. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Abigail. Um, Diana, would you like to comment as well? Yes. So what happened to George Floyd is shocking. And um, I fully understand. It's uh, I cannot imagine if the situation happened to our own brother, our own sister. This is, shouldn't be allowed in this country. I fully support peaceful protest. I do have a concern about the organization. I'm member of a UCI parents executive board. We have an initiative to sponsor a mid African American student in UCI. I'm fully support to be inclusive, to take care of underserved community. So in that sense, I'm fully support our smaller, even in Irvine, a smaller black community, make sure they are part of a big family. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, I have a question from Nina from Tustin. Uh, they would like to ask the candidates, how will you seek to reduce the overt police presence in Irvine? If anyone would like to answer first, please raise your hand. All right, uh, Christina, you have one minute. Um, so I actually have a pretty open line of communication with Irvine PD. I've had an interview with Patrick Nutato who oversees the um, uniformed officers. And apparently he's not aware of the driving while black and Irvine stigma. And um, a lot of people will can vouch for, you know, it being scary to drive through Irvine while being black because the police will pull you over and harass you for no apparent reason. And there are several citizens of Irvine who brought this to my attention and brought forth their stories of being harassed or Irvine PD dealing with their situations unaccordingly. So I think that reallocation of budgeting, and I think that uh, if you look at how much overtime the police department has really indulged in over the past, you know, um, budget, period that we can really cut back on the presence in the overtime and then reallocate some of that budgeting for other um, policies and our other programs that really need that and really could help Irvine supersede that level that we're at now. All right. Thank you, Christina. And uh, would anyone else be interested in answering this question? If not, we can go ahead. Oh, all right, Abigail, you have one minute. I think I've been pretty clear where I stand. I have a roommate who himself is a person of color and has been pulled over multiple times when me and my friends are in the car for not doing anything at all. Um, not only that, but defund the police is such a hot button rallying cry. And more than that, it's unnecessarily divisive. We live in an amazing city with officers that serve us, but it might be time to reimagine their role. It doesn't make sense to ask them to be social workers for homeless people or mentors to kids or teachers for people who don't know better. And our, we, are, we should not be asking them to be caseworkers for mental health issues either. 
We need to prevent problems before they create crime, before they become problems in our city. That is why I want to reimagine our public safety budget. In addition, the, in the interest of transparency and accountability, I support the notion of requiring the police department to hold open meetings with the community and a system that immediately removes an officer accused of wrongdoing. I also support uh, transparency you, uh, and body. Uh, we do have a quite a few questions today, so I'll go ahead and ask uh, one more time if anyone would like to tackle this question. If not, we can go ahead and move on. All right, uh, I'm not seeing anybody say yes, so uh, Michelle, go ahead and take it away. Sounds good. Our next question comes from an anonymous attendee. What are your plans to support making housing more affordable for students? Christina? Uh, you have one minute. So I don't have all the answers and Anon, I definitely am looking for those answers just as you as being a single mom and not having very much exposable income. I find it very difficult near like, no, I find it impossible to live in Irvine on my own or even with a roommate. I'm fortunate enough to have parents that love me enough to let me live at home with them, especially during these times of crisis. So I definitely think that, um, for students, I think maybe a zoning area where we allow that boarding house kind of, um, you know, presence to be, or that boarding house um, ordinance to be lifted during in that little zoning area, like maybe within like five miles of campus. Or something. I don't know. I'd have to sit down and talk to people about that because I am no expert. I don't know it all. I don't, you know, know everything. I definitely look for the people that do know more of me in that aspect. And if you have any, you know, ideas, I totally ask you to reach out like it takes all minds to come up with a solution for the greater or are they all good. I can't come up with them all by myself. So if you know you have any solutions or any ideas, because a lot of people, you know, think that um, it's just one person, but it's not. Thank you, Christina. Um, any of the other candidates wish to respond? All right, I saw Lauren's hand and then I'll call an Angel after. When we talk about the high cost of housing, I, we can't talk about it in a vacuum. We are experiencing economic inequality on a scale we have not seen before and that this generation has not seen before. We've seen the costs of the universities skyrocket, which is just taking money out of students and families' pockets. Compound that with the high cost of housing in this region, and it's no wonder folks are struggling to be able to go to university and get by in our city. So it's really critical that an Irvine City Council member collaborate with the UC Regents and developers to look at innovative solutions. We certainly have an inadequate supply and supply is one critical piece of that, but we can collaborate together to make sure that there are affordable options as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I'm sure you got your hand up, go ahead. Yes, so uh, I think this, this question is twofold because not every student can live in the UCI campus. They do not have the space of that kind or they do not have that kind of residences built. So some of the students, the seniors might have to live in the nearby communities and that is where this, uh, this pricing uh, problem is there and uh, you know the renting uh, prices are increasing. So we, we basically have to uh, sit down uh, city and the UCI people and come up to a, to a, a decision that we should be creating a different kind of uh, either, either uh, you know, residence because like I have seen on, on Jeffrey all over, you know, multi-story uh, buildings and, uh, you know, it's similar, I'm sure we can do uh, within UCI or nearby areas. Um, we have to preserve the open spaces also. So I think multi-story will be a good idea and uh, we, can, we can make that, uh, you know, affordable. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you um, Abigail, did you have your hand raised? Awesome. All right, go ahead. You have one minute. Once again, um, as I feel I've been saying all night, we need to make sure we're rezoning and creating areas where more housing can be built for said students. We also need to make sure we're offering those tax incentives so more places can get built. Um, not only that, but as we move forward, we want to make sure that rent 
completely stays affordable so that we don't end up fixing this problem. And then as our city and the university grows, it happens all over again and we're still stuck in the same place we were. Um, so thank you for your time. Diana, would you like to respond? Yes. Right. So the real issue is how we, how do we bring the rates down, the rent rate down and keep them down and maintain it. We need to build more apartments near the university and working with uh, UCI together to build more apartment around it. When we build enough supply to fill the demand, rates will stabilize. When the rate going up, it will provide incentive to build more apartments, will create more competition. So for lower rate, both now and in the future, we must encourage the construction of more multifamily units around the university. It's a basic economist. And we can do it by building the affordable housing according to the city general plan and the streamline the permitting process to make the construction can be in the place and uh, to be quicker construction. Thank you. All right, so our next question comes from an anonymous uh, attendee. Would you support creating more off street trails as well as fixing broken and missed bike connections? Um, whoever would like to go first, please raise your hand. Oh, I think I saw Lauren. It's a great question. And active transportation is such an important part of having a great experience living in Irvine, getting out in the open space, and also getting from place to place while combating climate change. As a city commissioner over all of our parks and open spaces, I've worked diligently for the last three and a half years active transportation and that includes activity but we can get from a street in areas where it can be clear our, our main streets are used as highways sometimes and it's just not compatible with active transportation so the future of this city is not only green but it increases active transportation it provides recreational opportunities not just to adults but to young people as well all right, uh, Lauren, I do want to inform you that you did cut out in the very beginning. So if you'd like, I can give you 30 seconds to uh, clarify that portion. Sure. I don't know what I didn't get heard saying, but I will say um, that as a city commissioner, I've been working really hard over the last three and a half years on active transportation, which is such an important part of living in Irvine. It allows us to get from A to B while combating climate change to be outdoors. It's terrific for our physical health and these pathways and transportation plan that should be moved forward. Uh, and when I'm elected on the council, I'll definitely be committed to improving upon what we have. All right. Uh, thank you, Lauren. And uh, Abigail, you do have one minute also. Um, I would like to say, of course, like as we were talking about before, creating more low income and housing students have access to. We wanna make sure that they can still get to school. Um, not only that, but Irvine's large draw is its beautiful space and your ability to be in the city and also be surrounded by nature. I have so many fond memories of going to class with Peter Baller down in the marsh at the Arboretum where he gives tours on Fridays, where you can just go and be part of nature. You can see our beautiful life, wildlife. It's an amazing time. Also like, if you haven't done his tour of the Arboretum, I would highly recommend he goes through and does all the edible plants that are in the marsh and make sure as we're going forward to conserve these natural spaces so that not only can we enjoy them, but everyone else that comes after us. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Abigail. Um, I do believe, uh, Christina, you have one minute and if anyone else is interested, please raise your hand. So um, with conservation and definitely repairing our things. I think with COVID-19 showing that um, 
our public spaces such as malls and movie theaters and everything can be taken away so easily and that we really need to cherish the land and available space that we have and the beauty that it really is. Um, I love taking that drive back on Pertola because it puts my child right to sleep. And I think that's something that we need to actively work to preserve. I love to take my child for walks on the trail back along Jeffrey. And it's something that we need to actively work to restore and be able to preserve these so that our children and our future can enjoy them for years to come. It's time for us to stop being kind of selfish. It's time for us to really look forward to a more innovative future and really preserving the beauty that we have before us. Because like I said before, the Lorax, are we gonna stop when we can only breathe air from a can that we have to buy? Thank you, Christina. And Anshul, you have uh, one minute if you wanna get the clock to reset really fast. Yeah, so in the in the same context as Christina was saying that we definitely have to preserve all these amenities which we have, and that's why I was like, uh, you know, stepping stones on uh, you know the the housing situation and the open area situation, and now now we have come to the come to the point where we have congestion issues of uh, traffic over here, and uh, you know people are complaining that they have uh, problems uh, breathing and uh, because of the air quality so that uh, again you know goes out to my my major uh, goal towards the solar energy and renewable energy and the electric cars and all that so we we definitely have to you know put all these things together and uh, make our city uh, a living dream i would call it which 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 everybody see so uh, that is how we can preserve everything, and I can make I will make sure that this is done, regardless. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Manshul. And uh, Diana, would you like to say? All right. You have one minute. So I think it would be very efficient if we kind of have an effective transportation system. Uh, for example, around the UCI, from UCI to different shopping uh, place to run the public transportation most efficiently. I work in the Bay Area for a while, and uh, in Bay Area, they have a better public transportation than we do. So we should learn the lesson, how to make sure the system can be designed and uh, run it effectively. Also, it's uh, because of the pandemic, and uh, we may have uh, more people working from home after post pandemic, we may have uh, continue have some people working from home. It may kind of change the traffic situation and the transportation system. We need to look at it carefully, how to design our system accordingly. Thank you. All right, thank you, Diana and uh, Michelle, uh, back to you. Awesome, so this will be our last question for tonight. Um, for the public, if you did submit any questions, we will be saving this for um, the debate on Wednesday. So hopefully your questions do get answered at some point. So our last question from Kristen asks, what are your plans to create a more inclusive, welcoming and supportive environment for the very small black community in your life? All right, Christina, I see your hand. Hey, so um, I don't know if you guys know, but Farah has this little, you know, black community round table and we've actually, you know, I'm a part of that and I'm actively, you know, I look at all the resolutions she's passed for and right now we're passing a resolution to be on our uh, upcoming uh, council, I think that's tomorrow actually for um, all inclusive and diversity. And I was really in support of that bill and had input and asked them like, hey, what is this really gonna do? And it's reaffirming the um, and it, uh, Irvine's commitment to being diverse and being all inclusive. And I think that's one of the first vital steps into having that um, small, like, you know, small, small black community included in um, more of Irvine's. Cause I even found it very difficult to be included in certain things in the small Irvine community. And that's something I think we really really need to change and I look forward to changing and by being a part of that change I mean what better way to be a part of the change than to be the change and so um I definitely with the given skill sets that I have and that I've shown and put forth in my life that you know I don't think that there's nobody that isn't an ad set to the community it isn't going to help push us forward in this small community thank you Christina any 
other kind of twitch to respond? Yes, so uh, on the same line, you know, Miss, I am, I, I also, you know, migrated uh, in this country in 1998 and, uh, you know, I myself uh, migrated from India and uh, I consider myself, uh, you know, minority by count. And uh, I would, I would definitely, and, and in, in Irvine, we have about 150 different uh, languages spoken. Uh, so there are so many, so many, uh, you know, small, uh, small uh, classes of people, uh, and while they are living, you know, separately. So I would, I, I would agree with Christina. And uh, hey, you know, if you want, feel free to call me for the tomorrow's meeting. I would, I would like to join these kinds of uh, efforts to work closely with the communities and have them, you know, not see each other with any any kind of hatred because you know i myself consider as a you know color blind by skin so it does not matter for me i i just want to be friends with everybody and that is what i have done and that is the passion which is bringing me to be running for the council thank okay. you thank you Anshul. any other candidates wish to respond um i'll go to abigail and then so when I started this, one of the very first groups that I reached out to was the Black Student Union, and I've been in contact them, with them since and have had multiple conversations with them and their members on what they need. Um, there are systems in place that prevent them from living their best life in Irvine, unfortunately, and we need to talk to them and make sure we're bringing them in to the policy making and making sure that we're addressing their issues, whether that be, you know, police on campus, whether that be lack of black owned businesses in Irvine, whether that be the ability to get resources that resonate with their specific interse intersectionality. Um, I wanna make sure going forward that we are taking that into account. Thank you. I think that the most important way that we can support our black residents is to bring them to the table. And that is why I formed a diversity action council on our campaign. I'm so proud that we have black residents. We have members of our third good Marshall bar association here in orange County biracial folks. And what we are doing is not only reaching out to members of the community, but planning that I'll be able to agendize the formation of a diversity commission. That commission will be able to bring voices and recognizing those are diverse voices. We have an intersectional black community. It's not monolithic. We have folks with different experiences and we want to hear their voices as it relates to institutional racism, discrimination, and be part at the table of solving these institutional problems and being part of the solution. So thank you. So Irvine is a harmonic, diversified city. I'm committed to continue keep that way. Myself, I'm a Canada woman. And I fully understand how minority it is. I share the same experience with all others. I'm a member of the UCI Parents Executive Board. We have an initiative to sponsor admit African American students. I'm a very good friend of our very small uh, African American community in Irvine. So if you visit my website, you can see it. Inclusive, respectful, and uh, to make sure Irvine is the city for everybody is my ultimate goal. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And thank you to all the candidates. Um, we have reached the end of our debate for tonight. So we'll be wrapping it up with your closing statements. Each of you will have two minutes to deliver your statement. Um, the order will be Anshul, Abigail, Christina, Diana, and then Lauren. So Anshul, you have two minutes. So uh, I, I have uh, actually tried to uh, show what I am and uh, I will continue to uh, do that in these uh, less than two minutes now. So my stand is basically, you know, more three stands I have been on. 
uh, no defunding of the police, supporting the small businesses and promoting the natural uh, energy. So these these are I, I don't want to I can't maybe uh, I do not want to promise too much, which was which which might have been promised by others too. What my goal is to get into the city and find out what is pending first of all, and take care of that. And if that is uh, you know the cemetery is one of them, then uh, let's go with it and deal with it. Do a final and you know share share the thoughts that's how i have worked throughout my life i have been in it for about 25 years where i have uh, talked to diversified people every kind of person you know in mexico in india in in, uh, in within within other states of the uh, united states so i have been uh, identified as a people's person who can really connect and listen before providing or promising anything and that is what has made me successful because i started as a programmer in, in 1995 i think and then i went up to the company for as a role of the vp of customer success and running for their uh, uh, you know development so what i am trying to say here is that i am i'm just about people i will hear everyone and I will do serve them the way, the best available way, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Anshul. Abigail, you're up next. UCI has reached out to the city council that existed before. I remember because I was there. I remember when the sitting city council, some of whom are candidates now, completely ignored student pleas. I remember the hopelessness and despair that I felt when I realized there was no one in the city council that represented the student voices. I've seen what that gets students at UCI. I was there when the students rallied together to talk about the no boarding house ordinance that passed despite student pleas that would make housing more expensive and higher education even more unattainable, especially for students of color. I watched student after student come forward completely filling the sitting area the voice to voice their concerns, but instead of a kind ear, some understanding and a promise to move forward together, we were rebuked. How that day turned out is a matter of public record and it is a travesty. The city council simply didn't care. Students rallied again to ask for a symbolic show of solidarity from the city council and for them to authorize flying the pride flag last year. The council ended up voting no despite the pleas from students who identify as LGBTQIA+, myself included. Because I identify as a member of that community, I was deeply hurt that once again, the city council did not care. And even again, we're seeing it with COVID. I am not going to let this happen again with as much as I can give. No matter who wins, I hope that you remember that the students are just as much a vital part of the city as anyone else. And that you as a city council person, you serve the people of Irvine all the people of Irvine. Now to those who are in power already and could have changed, I might have forgive you for not caring, but I will never forget that you didn't listen. I don't think any of these wonderful students at Irvine should ever forget how they have been repeatedly failed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Abigail. Christina, you are up next. Um, so I'm one of those people that like to keep it real honest and truth. And a lot of people here are, you know, in general will say whatever they feel like they need to say to win and will offer you the world of diversity and the world of inclusion, but slam the door in your face. And I feel like we need to keep that transparency. I feel like we need to keep that energy that we have seen from the Black Lives Matter movement going. I think Irvine is at a point where it can either go up and continue towards that prospering level, or it can go down and keep going to a point of where we see just complete other, um, isolation from one group to another. I believe that um, truly being a minority here in Irvine, you know, one of like, you know, part of that 2% that exists here in Irvine, I don't feel included in everything that Irvine does. I don't feel included as like a viable part of Irvine and I'm going to change that. My voice will be heard. I won't be silenced. I will be spoken. I will speak. I will, he I will change the way people see our whole culture, our whole group. 
And all it takes is one person. And if I can be that one person to sort of pave that way, even if it's paved with my many attempts and failures, at least the person behind me, behind me have those stepping stones. At least that I know that nothing I do is in vain, that everything I do and that I work for and achieve for, everything I strive for is for something, for someone, because I promise that there will be change here in Irvine. I promise that I will do everything invested in me to do, to be, to just exceed all those expectations that I've set for myself and so that Irvine will be that next level. Irvine will go towards that self-sufficiency. We will not be breathing air that we buy out of a can. We will not, I will not let that succumb to Irvine. I will do everything because Irvine has always prided, this, prided itself on being the leader and being the best at everything. Well, let's be the leader and the best at diversity, all inclusion, our energy and everything we do. We can make it happen, but it starts with you and it starts with voting and it starts with, you know, making and being that change. If you need help to the polling booths, I got four seats. Thank you, Christina. Diana, you are up next. Um, again, thank you for, for your time. And uh, I'm a good listener. Professionally, I need a team of culturally diverse engineers in one of our leading international technology companies. In that capacity, I plan, take a significant input, corroborate, and execute to achieve design outputs. If elected, I will donate my entire city council salary to urban education and the senior programs. I'm also a member of the farthest growth demographic of Asia population. I share this experience with our community. I'm fruit in English and mentoring, critical to bring in engagement. I'm also served proudly as a co-chair of Urban Children Youth Family Advisory Committee. I serve on the UCI Social Science Leadership Society and the UCI Parent Executive Board. My volunteer and professional work has always been a diverse environment. I will work to team with the innovation and the research center in our university like UCI to advocate Silicon Ranch in Irvine to bring more job to UCI students. If you believe we need a representative with a technology background and a diverse background, as many of you in our city council to moving forward on the right direction, please put faith on me and vote for me. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And fifth, we have Laura. I want to share my student experience, which is having gotten an early admission to the university of my choice the same year that my dad lost his job and we survived in our family on my mom. You know what it's like to work three jobs during undergrad every summer and winter break to pay for an education that was out of reach and to work three jobs during law school and every summer and winter to be able to have that education to provide myself opportunities that my family didn't have. Now, I would like to say that things have gotten better, but even though I left university with over $100,000 in student loan debt, I see students every day struggling even more. That's why I formed a student advisory council on my campaign. I wanna hear the voices of students and what I'm hearing is dire. I'm hearing that home ownership remains out of reach, but so do rents. I'm hearing that some young people are even delaying having a family. And so the policies that are implemented on a city council level must be progressive and with the future and young people in mind. You know, on the city council, we can't solve all of society's problems. We can't provide Medicare for all or implement a Green New Deal, but you know what we can do? We can start right here in our city, putting forth progressive programs that impact our residents and improve the quality of all of our lives. That's my commitment to you. And I'll always have an open door policy to students. I look forward to working with you and bringing you to the table with me. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for your closing statements. Um, and thank you to the audience for joining ASUCI and AGS for the first, uh, first night of debates for Irvine City Council. 
Night two will be on Wednesday, October 14th from 7 p.m. to 9.15 p.m. And we will have a debate between candidates Larry Agron, Laura Bratton, uh, Dylan Green, Tammy Kim, and Carrie O'Malley. Please remember to register to vote with the link provided in the chat. Thank you and have a good night. And I believe Nini's up next. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, candidates, if you would like to stay a couple minutes after, you're free to go, but um, I wanted to allow some of the participants to speak to you directly if you guys are okay with that. But if you need to go, feel free to go. Um, attendees, if you guys want to say something to one of the candidates, um, you can raise your hand, use the raise hand feature, um, and then we'll give you permission to talk to one of the candidates. Um, if nobody wants to speak, then we will all go to bed early tonight. <laughs> yeah. I'll give another 30 seconds if anybody wants to speak to any of the candidates directly or ask sure. their question. We are here. Oh, we got one. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, Dylan, you can speak. Uh, I'm, I'm another candidate. I just wanted to say good job, everybody. I really love the debate and I loved watching you guys. Just wanted to give you guys some positivity to end on. Thank you. Oh, thank you that very much. That was cool. Thanks, Dylan. That was awesome, man. <laughs> uh, we look forward to seeing you today on Wednesday, Dylan. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> thank you, guys. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.